Well, Mr. Peasteak, which I think you must be, because I don't think there would be a Mrs. Peasteak. Could, could I be wrong about that? You want to know what historical figures, events, movements, or books I feel have been ignored or underemphasized in the public education of young people. Here's a piece of advice about asking a question. Try and narrow it down a bit. Try and make it more incisive. Um, try and make it get under my skin. Uh, you give me too much to choose from. And you're likely to get either everything or nothing, and I certainly can't do everything. I'll try not to do nothing. If you mean in the United States, I think that the, uh, the study of the founding of the country, the emergence of the United States as the world's first and only, still only, um, secular democratic republic, federal republic, um, is terribly understudied these days. The, the likelihood that there wouldn't ever have been a revolution if there hadn't been an a inter-imperialist fight between England, Spain, and France, um, the likelihood that it could have been just a re rebellion of colonies um, wanting to hold on to their old English privileges, the extraordinary odds against there being an Enlightenment revolution sponsored by people like Thomas Paine and Thomas Jefferson, who really believed that the United States should declare not just for its own rights, but for the rights of all men, which is the great breakthrough based on the writing of John Locke and other Enlightenment figures is the, is the most ignored and underemphasized. Instead, we get happy stories about George Washington crossing the Delaware and um, matters of this kind that are uh, later replaced by the stories of Parson Weems about George Washington being a moral hero and a sort of superman, which don't show the grit and the grain of how revolutionary our revolution was. If I could change one thing, it would certainly be that. And the great book to read, since you imply that I should mention one, would be Theodore Draper's book, um, A Struggle for Power, uh, which is a very good history of the germinal events without which the American Revolution couldn't have taken place or would have taken a different form. Scariot, which is an, a somehow suggestive name, asks me from what he's read or she's read it seems I initially supported the intervention of the United States in Iraq and Afghanistan. <clears throat> Do you believe that it's had, he asks or she asks, a positive or negative impact on the growth and exposure of Islamic extremism? Also, given that the countries are still plagued with problems many years after the initial invasions, what direction do you think US foreign policy should take now? Implied in that is the idea that the influence on the Islamic world is created by us or by our intervention. In fact, in the salient case that you mentioned of Afghanistan, um, the Talibanization of Afghanistan, it, it's, it's a takeover by a very vicious, cruel theocracy that ran Afghanistan into the ground and also invited Al-Qaeda as a partner into the country to help to destroy the patrimony of Afghanistan to blow up the treasures of Bamiyan and the Buddhist and other non-Islamic uh, statues and museums in the place uh, was only because the United States was disengaged from Afghanistan. Uh, it's very important not to forget that. Um, as with Somalia, uh, as with Afghanistan, uh, as with Saudi Arabia to some extent, uh, these tendencies arise because we're not looking. And it's certainly true that Osama bin Laden used to say uh, that he was not uh, afraid of the United States because he thought it wouldn't fight, uh, not because it would. And so I think a lot depends on one's being able to say that he was wrong about that. In other words, it's not the case that we are disliked because we resist Islamic imperialism, the attempt to create a new caliphate, a new Islamic empire in the world. It's much more likely that we'll be despised if we don't take a stand against it, and they will believe that this hastens the day when this great new empire will dawn. So there's no choice but to resist it. 
And it was a choice that was, to some extent, forced upon us, but I think we should recognize it when it arrives. Board Greg asks, in a rather laconic way, where I get my news. And I would say that I was once quoted in some online dictionary of quotations. I've never been able to find it again. My son pointed it out to me as saying that um, I became a journalist because I didn't want to rely on the press for information. Which partly true. Uh, I, I um, get most of my information from other writers, other reporters, other journalists based in other countries, or journalists based from other countries who are assigned to Washington. Uh, what they tell me is all the stuff they couldn't get into their own paper or past their own editor. And that's, a, that's my main source of information. Uh, I rather pity people who have to rely on the output of the journalistic profession to, to be informed. And then there are one or two websites I sometimes look at. But generally speaking, I'm old enough now that people will send me things that they think would interest me and um, from all over the world. So that's, that's what I do as soon as I flap through the New York Times in the morning, which I do so as to be sure that I know what other people think is going on or what the news is. Um, D. Roberts, 1982, uh, says that I've stated the litmus test for the Obama administration is Iran. How is the president doing in this area? Uh, well, litmus test is, of course, a cliche. I hope I didn't use it in that, um, well, that voice, but um, it, it still wouldn't be untrue. Um, there are two senses in which we're in confrontation over Iran. One is it has a regime that's illegally trying to acquire and to conceal its acquirement of um, thermonuclear weapons. So we'll soon find out uh, what our most ancient worry will look like. By our most ancient worry, I mean our most, maybe our deepest modern worry. Uh, what will it be like when people who have a fanatical apocalyptic ideology, get hold of messianic weapons. Well, we'll soon find out what it's like to have to be nice to people like that because they're, they're driving their country into bankruptcy in order to produce this program. And lying to the United Nations, to the International Atomic Energy Authority, to the European Union and to everybody else about uh, the, the ways in which they've been doing this. But they've been caught lying. Repeatedly, they make a profession of lying. That's the first thing. This, in other words, the evidence for what we believe does not come from some overworked CIA. Um, the second thing is that we have every reason to believe, and as someone who's visited the country, I would want to tend to confirm that Iranian public opinion, especially among the young, is overwhelmingly anti-theocratic and sympathetic to the United States and wants a restoration of good relations with us. So the question is, this movement having been proven to exist in the recent, I won't even call them elections, in the recent attempt to fake an election in Iran, whether we can synchronize our policy uh, so as to say we're both for the democratization and the denuclearization of Iran, since the two things are connected. Iran can only come back into the comity of nations when it is a democracy and when it is um, uh, proven that its nuclear program is only for peaceful and economic purposes. After all, we're willing to build them, the reactors. We're willing to give them all the centrifuges they need on the assurance that that's all they want. A very generous offer. Well, the president's line on this is that um, it's ni it would be nice to have the Islamic Republic of Iran, as he put it, back in the family of nations. Well, my, my response to that is it's because it's an Islamic Republic that it can't be in the Comity of Nations because it's because it's an Islamic Republic that it maltreats and oppresses and tortures and kills its own people. And also it's because it's, it is an Islamic Republic that it uh, conducts this covert, uh, insane nuclear operation designed for blackmail against its mainly Sunni Arab neighbors, by the way. It's not really intending, at least at first, to attack Israel, let alone us. But it will be used to blackmail the Gulf states uh, that have less capacity to defend themselves. So that the problem with the president's policy is that he believes that the disagreement between ourselves and the Islamic Republic arises from a misunderstanding. And I, I can't be persuaded that that's really true. It's not a cultural or psychological matter. It's a radical difference of interest. 
and nothing is really going to be able to happen until um, the Iranian people are allowed to interfere in their own internal affairs, until we have a government we can show is their choice, and until we can be certain that they're not simply running out the clock of diplomacy in order to equip themselves with illegal weaponry. So, um, yes, that could be described as a litmus test. Calador, I can't decode that name, <coughs> asks if I and my fellow horsemen, Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, and Samuel Harris, are sometimes referred to collectively as new atheists. What does this mean to you? Do you embrace it? Or do you hold there's nothing particularly new? Well, um, and he asked me also if I agree with the mention of the word brights as a definition of the unbeliever. Um, the the uh, Four Horsemen was a fairly cheap idea. It was my own. Um, I, actually, it's supposed to be the Four Horsemen of the Counter-Apocalypse. It's just a happy, happy coincidence that four of us published books around the same time. But the inclusion is absurdly flattering to me. Uh, Richard Dennett, sorry, <coughs> Richard Dawkins, and Daniel Dennett and Samuel Harris are, are great men of science in their respective fields, um, anthropology and neuroscience. In Richard's case, preeminently biology, They've, they would be great educators uh, and educators for the theory of evolution and for human reason, even if they'd never said a word about religion. But they all decided that in the present crisis, where we're threatened on all sides by different sorts of theocrat, mad Israeli settlers, <laughs> Islamic jihadists, Christians who want to have garbage taught in American schools, and so forth. A paper see that says that AIDS may be bad, but condoms are worse. That there has to be a pushback. There has to be a resistance. I'm the least of these. I don't think there's anything particularly new about it. Um, we all agree on one proposition, which was that our great late friend, uh, Stephen Jay Gould, himself a tremendous educator and paleontologist, um, was wrong in when he said that science and religion are non-overlapping magisteria. We, we do believe that essentially these things are incompatible or at any rate very, very difficult to reconcile. Um, I did quarrel with my, uh, some of my uh, comrades by saying I thought that to call ourselves brights would be in the first place very conceited um, and in the second place very misleading. Uh, we do not say of people who disagree with us that they are stupid. And many very, very intelligent people have been um, persuaded by Thomas Aquinas' uh, ontological arguments for the existence of God, uh, for example. There's no, it's not an IQ question. I, I thought it was a, a false issue, and I, I'm, I'm rather glad to see it in, gone into some kind of eclipse recently. Um, let's see. 1984 was not a manual. Excellent name. If you were the Prime Minister of the UK, what would you do to combat religious extremism? Also, can and should the UK government try to encourage atheism? And if so, how? Well, um, combating extremism is not done very easily if you grant its first premise. What the Labour government in Britain has been doing is trying to find ways of negotiating with the fairly large settlement of Muslim citizens in the UK mainly from Pakistan and Bangladesh, and it's made what I think is the historic mistake of assuming that these communities are represented by their mosques and by their mullahs, uh, instead of by their teachers, by their community leaders uh, and others. And this has been a terrible concession. Uh, it's led as far as the head of the Anglican Church, uh, Rowan Williams, head of the Church of England, actually is saying that there should be separate courts for Muslims, Sharia courts in the United Kingdom. In other words, giving up the essential idea that the law is the same for everybody and everybody is equal under that law. Saying, so not if you're a Muslim, you can go to your own court. Now, we have in Britain now cases of honor killings of girls who are said to have disgraced their families, say by marrying out of Islam or marrying out of the clan. Um, we have forced marriages, we have imported marriages. People go back and effectively by brides in Pakistan. Um, these, we have uh, instances of genital mutilation of um, female children. This kind of thing is, is not, I think, to be excused as a, a cultural difference. It is to be brought within the ambit of the law and to be judged as if it would be if it was a non-Muslim person doing it. So uh, the surrender 
by the Labour government to um, clerical forces in this matter and by the Church of England is a terrible concession, a terrible appeasement that I think uh, the whole society will soon come to regret. Dingle Dog has a heartfelt question for me saying that he or, I guess it can't be she if it's Dingle Dog, is a nationally ranked policy debater in college, and despite years of debating practice and research, I'm occasionally stumped by a question asked by my opponent. Has there ever been a question asked for which you had no good answer? And if so, what is your typical strategy in dealing with those situations? Well, um, in principle, um, that number of questions should be going up because Socrates tells us that the only definition of being educated, let alone learn it, is to begin to understand how little you know. And it's only when you have grazed on the lower slopes of your own ignorance and begun to understand the great vistas of non-knowledge that you have that you can claim to have been educated at all. So it ought to be the case that I'm repeatedly confronted with questions like that. In fact, I suppose the one that is most often asked is, um, how can I say I know there's no God? And these are from people who don't understand the ABC of the atheist argument, which is that we don't say and can't prove um, that there's no God, but we will say there's no good evidence and there's never yet been involved a good argument for saying that there is. That's why we're more modest than we perhaps look sometimes. Whereas those who say there is, don't only say there is, because that means they've won an argument, but they say there is in order that they can claim the authority of that God to tell other people what to do. So they make an extraordinary claim with only very ordinary, at best, evidence, sometimes obviously fantastic evidence, fabricated evidence. Um, and they make very, very large claims for themselves. They say, well, now I know what God wants. You have to do what I want. Um, we repudiate that. Um, and we say, no, there are, there are a couple of easier, simpler questions that you haven't answered yet, like the difference between being a deist and a, a theist, for example. So I like to think that um, at least while I'm debating with people of that kind, they're not going to come up with a question that I haven't heard before. But on every other subject, uh, whether it was paleontology, biology, uh, political economy, uh, anthropology, I would expect that there would be an, an infinite number of questions to which I wouldn't even begin to have an answer because I simply wouldn't know. Um, that's really the, the principal difference. If, you, if there's something where there is doubt, don't claim you're certain. Uh, it's amazing how relaxing it is not to pretend to know more than you do. I'm, I'm surprised that those who claim to speak in the name of God don't take more advantage of this relief. So, Ad Leomofa, opaque, says, you've called yourself a Marxist, but you say you no longer consider yourself a socialist. This issue was addressed in a Reason article a while ago. Could you elaborate? For instance, is the power of the unaccountable corporation no longer a major concern for you? You've also been eerily silent on the healthcare debate, as far as I know, why? As far as I know, comma, why? Well, um, in a way, I can't stop uh, myself thinking in the, in the way I was first trained to think, which is as someone who believes in the materialist conception of history, who thinks that people act not according to their proclaimed ideals so much as they do according to their interests. In other words, that... The Crusades, for example, were not entirely a, a spiritual event, but were to do with unresolved uh, rivalries and contradictions in the material world. Actually, it's almost commonplace now to do this. Almost all historians are Marxists in that sense. They, they don't judge people by their opinions of, each, of themselves, but by some more objective standard. Um, Marx used to, having understood that capitalism was very revolutionary, and praised it for being so revolutionary and so dynamic, uh, hoped that the working class could learn from capitalism uh, and take over its dynamism, but without its contradictions and without its cruelties. I'd have to say that that didn't work out um, in quite the way that it had been hoped. And then, in fact, capitalism survived a number of its crises and near collapses. 
and has re-emerged as still a very dynamic and innovative force. So I, I feel that's a historical defeat for the socialist idea, if not for the Marxist one. I hope that's not too uh, glib a reply. Um, as to whether private corporations can do more damage or are equally dangerously unaccountable as are governments or states or bureaucracies, I, I, I'm willing to split the difference, if you like. I mean, it, it depends really in which country you live. But I certainly think that the, the worst outcome ever achieved was probably in Eastern Europe uh, before the overthrow of communism, where there were all the disadvantages of an unaccountable uh, industrialism, pollution, um, waste, uh, ecological despoliation, uh, secrecy, exploitation, um, misery on the assembly line and in the workplace, with absolutely none of the advantages of uh, the innovative uh, forces of, of capital. It was a, something that was parasitic on loans from the rest of Europe. So uh, I think it's worth bearing that in mind. And of course, in China at present, you have an absolute collusion between a supposedly all-powerful state, which still officially operates in the, in the name of uh, communist ideology, and a, a very large number of very unaccountable private corporations, both Chinese uh, located, uh, endogenous, if you like, local to China, and multinational corporations that um, want to take advantage of them. So there's no necessary opposition between these two things. You can easily get a synthesis of them, either positive or negative. On the healthcare debate, uh, wake me when it's over. Um, I, I remember Richard Nixon getting us so near to healthcare, or so we all thought, uh, that I've become a little bit cynical about this. I sometimes think healthcare is the default position of politicians who are in, in a corner. Um, the, there seems to be something about the United States, I sometimes think, that sort of doesn't really want healthcare. That even people who could most benefit from it in this country don't want it. Um, I almost think it's psychic sometimes, or psychological, I mean. They, they'd rather live dangerously. They'd rather not live in a country where they were taken care of. I hope this doesn't sound flippant, but I don't expect there ever to be socialized medicine in the United States, if, if that's what you mean. Not even if everybody did want it, which they, I think, don't. I hope that doesn't sound too cynical. Um, Palsh 7 has identified the essence of the question what consensus exists between socialism and libertarianism? Well, he hasn't identified the essence. He's only put the question. How did this creep in? How did this guy make the cut? Just kidding. Um, I suppose, well, at, at least at the beginning um, of each movement, the, the thing in common that the socialist movement had, well, there wasn't a libertarian movement in the early days of the industrial Revolution. You don't really get libertarian movements until there's a certain amount of, of peace, democracy, and prosperity, and where the, the hard task of building a state and creating the nation has been done. So it's a historic question in some ways, but let's say that socialism begins, Marxism certainly begins, by looking forward to the end of the state, uh, to the withering away of the state, as Marx and Engels famously put it, and to as they better put it, actually, to the replacement of the government of men by the administration by men of things. And that bit of the, of the ideal got dropped out in the terrible struggles in, in Europe and elsewhere in the 20th century over nation states, wars, crises, and revolution. But the, 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 certainly the original idea was that the state was not the arbiter of social uh, disputes, but the product of them and that if you could remove certain contradictions, there would be less and less need for an absolute authority. The libertarians have got the same point in a, in a different way. Um, but I, I think that they, they always suffer to me from the disadvantage of being, um, I think I said before, ahistorical. What would have been a libertarian position on the Franco-Prussian War, um, on the on the collapse of Tsarism in Russia, on the rise of fascism, um, on the military-industrial complex, on all these things. There's so many things on which there's no distinctively libertarian position to take. 
uh, what, what's a libertarian view of the Vietnam War, say, or the Chinese Revolution? Um, it's a bit thin. It's a bit uh, faint. Um, but nonetheless, I, I've always said and believed that I don't trust anyone who doesn't have a bit of the libertarian and the anarchist within them. Someone who says that I don't, I don't make the presumption that those in charge know better than I do. And I also don't make the presumption that they have the right to tell me what to do unless they've, they repeatedly have earned that right. And so <clears throat> it's very important that one has some libertarian and anarchist um, elements in one's own makeup, I believe. Um, Neil Kay wants me to say why my speaking style, though it's unlike the norm today, and then he goes on to say some needlessly flattering things. What goes into this effect? Um, are there any other speakers or schools of rhetoric you draw from? What do you think of the state of rhetoric and public debate in America? If, you, if, if, if he doesn't think I'm dodging the question, I'll answer it backwards. Um, there's a real difference between the, the culture in which I was brought up and the American one that's prevailing now. Um, I was brought up to debate um, where there was a clear-cut motion, win or lose, uh, sharply drawn, either in school debating societies, later on at the Oxford Union, model in a way on the parliamentary system, where in addition to being able to do your own presentation as sharply, as toughly as you could make it, you were also expected, if the case should arise, to be able to take the other person's position on the other side of the dispatch box and know their own case well enough to put it yourself if you had to, uh, just for an exercise. I think that is a good training. In the United States, uh, the whole model is opposite. Um, the Constitution is based on consensus building, you know, probably for good reason, very plural, very various country. Uh, I, there's never been a debate in the Senate, though I've heard there have been such things reported as having occurred. There's never been one, as far as I know. All that happens is that different senators or representatives get up and give the speech they were going to give anyway and then sit down. They don't exchange. Uh, they don't do thrust and parry uh, at any level at all. It's just, I, here's my view on this, and now the honorable gentleman can give his. There's, there's no interpenetration of opposites. Uh, the same is true of presidential debates now, uh, which, in fact, I think are wrongly so called. You, The ground rules of the presidential debates are the two candidates can't speak directly to each other. That means, by definition, it's not a debate. It's all run through the moderator. It's more like a joint press conference. Um, by contrast, most TV supposed debates are merely shouting matches, you know, where there's no attempt to really state contrasting position. So my conclusion from this idiosyncratic might be interesting to you is this. The reason why the courtroom drama is such a big feature of American life and one of the great things that America's given to the world in, in television and film and, and some novels too is that the courtroom drama fascinates people in this country because for once they're watching something that isn't fixed that they know really is a debate and where the outcome isn't predetermined, which shows that there's a real hunger for rhetoric and flair and uh, debate and conflict and irreconcilable opposition where someone's got to go down at the end of this. It's not going to be a big handshake at the end. And that's what I want out of a, out of a debate. And um, so my own version of it is an improvisation of the, um, the English one, uh, where you hope to try and be able to be funny about serious things, but also serious about amusing ones, and see if you can keep people on their guard and then try and catch them off it as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, I could, I could add one thing if you liked. I mean, the... The method is sometimes called the, the Socratic one, where you start by asking questions. Um, and you go on until the question's been exhausted. So that it's in a way a process of elimination. It's the, sometimes called also the Platonic Symposium. The, the Passover Seder is vaguely modeled on and derived from this, where people uh, 
sit around, usually with wine, not one of the few Jewish ceremonies that does insist on wine. Questions are asked, you know, admittedly in a certain well-known order, but to the youngest person present who gets the chance to be bright. And uh, by the process of questioning, things are elicited. That's not exactly a debate, but it's a good means of um, ordering the mind. And a lot better than getting together in a church to give regular incantations where everyone has to be reminded again for the how many times a week it is, time, uh, that they all believe the same thing and that uh, they're absolutely united and agreed upon it. And you feel that that's always a sign of insecurity rather than confidence. 